Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? How are you? I really hope you're well. I, as you've seen in my last update, am not great. I went to the doctor's office, and unfortunately, it was not just an annual physical. Um, I had some issues that I needed to go get addressed. So, for any of you who have an internet medical degree, um, diagnose me. So about seven months ago, I woke up and could not move my left arm very much. I, I honestly do not remember injuring it. I don't remember straining it, stretching it, hitting it on anything. No trauma that I can think of. I just woke up and it, it like would not move. So I'm gonna show you, this is, this is as high as I can lift it. And you can see I'm kind of I tend to tilt that way to try to, oh, look, I can lift it up higher. I'm not, I can't actually lift it up. So shoulder straight, I can do this. On the other arm, I can do this. Um, for, okay, that's as high as I can lift it up or in front of me. And on this arm, whew. so if you want to compare, that's all I can do. Um, this arm, I can whew, right behind me. Lean on it, lay on it, whatever I want to do. This arm. I can get my elbow that far and my arm. Okay, that's as far as I can get. Everything hurts when I try it. So that's the other thing. My arm doesn't hurt if I'm keeping it within whatever range I can actually move in. But once I hit the limit of where I can move it, if I try to go beyond that, it does hurt quite a bit. And when I say my arm, I mean my arm. My shoulder, joint, nothing, no pain. Um, the pain is coming in, I don't know if you can see where my seam on my sweater is, but essentially right here, right at the end of the seam of the sweater. So I was Googling it and I was looking at the structure of the arm. So the deltoid muscle comes down kind of to a point here and then there's the bicep. And there's like a tendon that connects the deltoid and the bicep. Now, arm issues in this area could maybe be deltoid muscle, they could be bicep muscle. Um, so I thought maybe I had a tear in my deltoid muscle and those can take a very, very long time depending on how serious the muscle tear is. It can be up to six months. So I'm at month seven and it has not improved at all. In fact, it's, it's getting slightly worse because I'm having pain when I sleep because my arm is being moved into a position while I sleep because I'm a side sleeper that is painful to me. So it keeps waking me up. So I think I've ruled out a deltoid muscle tear. I, it's not a bicep issue because I can lift heavy things. I can push, I can move furniture, I can carry things. Um, I have full muscle strength. I just don't have arm movement. So it's not a torn or injured muscle. It's not in my shoulder joint itself. So I am pretty sure it's not a rotator cuff issue. All right, internet sleuths. Down in the comments below, tell me what I have. I wait. If you said frozen shoulder, you're correct which is what I guessed that I had as well, but I desperately wanted to not be the case. So finally went to the doctor yesterday. He did some arm movements, some strength tests, flexibility tests and everything. And he said, I am pretty darn sure you have frozen shoulder. <sighs> so that sucks. Um, so he's sending me to an orthopedic specialist and I will find out what can be done. Now, I was under the impression that nothing can be done and that it just kind of goes away on its own within one to three years, which is super odd, but okay. The problem is after seven months, I realize I cannot wait to like a three year timeline and not know what it is. If it's a full year, that would still be a, quite a stress on me, but I could probably manage it. But to not know and to go maybe a whole year without seeking help and then have it end up being two years or three years. I just, I can't, I can't do it. I have too many responsibilities uh, and I have too much in life that I need an arm for. 
Uh, so I am going to have to go to the specialist and find out what to do. And I did ask my doctor, when he said orthopedic specialist, I was like, oh my God, do I need to have surgery? And he said, no, 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 no. If, you know, it's, it's, it's most likely gonna be injections, physical therapy and or massage therapy. And I was like, okay, I really don't want my arm flayed open. So we'll see how that goes. I will keep you guys updated. If it's of any interest to anybody, please feel free to ask any questions. Um, or if you have experience with it or have somebody that you know that has had it and you have any tips to share or just any information about what the experience can be like, please let me know. I'm, I'm very interested in it. And I'm a little nervous to see what I'm gonna have to do. Um, physical therapy scares me for two reasons. One, Moving my arm is excruciating when it comes to where I can't move it. Uh, it's not discomfort, it is excruciating pain. And when I have accidentally jarred my arm, if I, I hit it on a door jam once, and I just, I have a very high tolerance for pain. I collapsed, couldn't breathe, and tears were streaming down my face. It hurt so badly. So. I'm, I'm, I'm a little nervous. I'm not scared, but I'm definitely nervous. The second reason I uh, am scared of physical therapy is far more frightening. I don't know how to pay for it because I have medical insurance, but I have a high deductible plan, meaning they're not gonna cover anything. And in the physical therapy bills that I have seen uh, recently, uh, without insurance coverage, you're looking at around 400 plus dollars a session. And physical therapy is usually two to three times a week for four weeks to start with. Now, I may be bad at math, but I know I can't afford that, which is partly, mostly, almost 100% why I have not gone to the doctor in seven months to have it looked at because I assumed that was actually going to be the solution was physical therapy. Um, and my doctor, absolute sweetheart, I, I just adore him. So kind, so compassionate, so non-judgmental, so just wanting to help people feel their best. Very kindly asked me, honey, why did you wait to come see me? You have such an incredibly limited range of motion and you are in so much pain. Why did you wait seven months? Why didn't you come see me sooner? And I'm like, because I'm American and we live in an American healthcare hellscape. Um, and he understood, but he's like, nobody should have to live with this kind of pain, especially when there's something can, that can be done about it. Uh, and gently, kindly encouraged me not to suffer in silence, which is, ab he's absolutely right. And that would be great if our healthcare system also felt that way. Um, but that aside, I will figure out what needs to be done, whether I can afford to go through with therapies and treatments yet or not. We will see. I do have the ability to change my insurance coming up in our annual open enrollment in November, at which point I will be choosing a different healthcare plan, one that will actually cover stuff. Because the one that I chose, and it's my own fault, but I chose a high deductible plan thinking, I'm young and healthy. I will choose the high deductible plan that covers absolutely nothing, but lets me sock away pre-tax money into a health savings account that I can then use for major expenses. It turns out though, my plan had one precious flaw. I am in fact not young and healthy. Imagine my dismay at finding this out. So we'll see. Um, so yeah, that's my health update and I will keep you guys informed as new appointments come up and, and what, medical, uh, what medical advice and therapies are recommended because I think it's just a very interesting subject and if I can put this out there and a single person out of anybody on the internet sees it and it can help them, I'm happy, I love it. So that's that. And I do have two book updates for you. Um, I was listening to The Buried Giant on audiobook. And can I just say, I love this book. I finished it. I gave it 3.75 stars. 
It's close to a four star for me. It's not quite there, but it is close. The couple that are the main characters, Axel and Beatrice, are these two old people who just decide to go on a journey to go see their son. And they're the cutest couple. Axel never calls his wife Beatrice or any other pet name other than Princess. It's so sweet. And along the way on their journey, they meet with a warrior from another land, a boy who's being uh, cast out from his village. They meet Sir Gawain from Arthur's court, who is now a very old knight, and um, his uh, noble steed, and a, a number of other characters, but those are the, those are the four main players. There's, uh, they're searching for a dragon for a good portion of the book when that was not why these two old people set out. They just wanted to go visit their son uh, in a nearby village. Just a lovely, enchanting little story on its own. But what I really, really liked about it was the, the exploration of memory, loss of memory, and healing. So the interesting thing about the world post King Arthur, after the Britain and Saxon War has ended, there's peace throughout the land, even if there's not goodwill exactly. Um, at least the Britons and the Saxons are no longer at war. But anywhere within this land, there is a mist constantly. And there are rumors that the mist is causing people to forget. And it's, it's a phenomenon that's happening to literally everybody in the land. And it's been that way for a long time, as long as anybody can remember, which is ironically not very far back because um, they, they forget things that happened that day. So this older couple, when the book starts, they, they don't even remember that they have a son. They actually actively wonder like, did we have children? And then eventually their memories sort of vaguely float in and out and they realized, yes, they did have a son. He's an adult. He's in some other village they meant to visit. When did they mean to visit? Why did they mean to visit? Why didn't they go visit? So they were like, you know what? We're just going to do this. We're going to go on this little journey. We're going to walk to this village nearby that our son lives and we're going to visit him. And that's what starts the catalyst for their entire journey, which is just like I said, incredibly enchanting. Um, but as they explore more of the land, they, they sort of get sidetracked into trying to understand what is causing this mist. And is the mist what is causing the forgetfulness? Really what they want to do is find what is causing everyone to forget everything. What is the source? Is it intentional? Is it, you know, natural? And is there a way to stop it so that people can get their memories back? And as they kind of talk to people about what they're trying to do, people sort of start to raise the question of, is that a good idea? Do you think that's wise? And it's because there's this uneasy feeling that some people have of maybe we're better off forgetting. You know, maybe there's a reason we're not remembering things. And what if you fix this? And everybody's memories comes back and it causes problems. And I think that's an incredibly interesting topic to explore. And the way that they did this in this Arthurian fairy tale, I thought was just perfect. And it's, I'm very interested in psychology. I'm very interested in trauma. And like I've mentioned before, one of my favorite books, and I'm pointing up here like you can see my, my wall bookshelf, which you can't, but I have The Body Keeps the Score um, by Dr. Uh, Vanderkolk, and it, it is an absolutely amazing read about how trauma, physical trauma, emotional trauma, any kind of trauma, how it affects your brain, how it rewires your brain, and then how your brain controls your body, and that your body physically stores trauma. And part of trauma can be repressed memories. And so that's the, the lens that I looked, I, I looked at this book through of, okay, there's, there's a forgetfulness that is clearly widespread. There's, there's something either unnatural or intentional about it, or maybe both. What is happening? Why is this happening? And is it similar to like 
repressed memories and and so that's it was just it was fascinating to me the topic and I thought the book explored it incredibly sensitively and incredibly elegantly and I just loved it I just loved it and I've, re I've read some some good read reviews where people said that they felt that the characters were flat they weren't interesting they weren't um, anything to become attached to and I'm like what book did you guys read like everybody can have their own experience with a book a absolutely I can't fathom not adoring these characters though um, so I, I absolutely loved it um, I'm going to try to talk about it a little bit more in depth in my wrap up um, obviously without spoiling anything though so The Buried Giant 3.75 stars go read it I thought it was wonderful. Um, okay, so then my last book update is my ebook, which was Days of Distraction. And this one I'm a little bit torn on. Um, and it's, it's not the content of the book or the quality of the writing. It's the style that it was chosen to be written in, which is, it, to me, it kind of feels a little bit like half stream of conscious, consciousness. I don't remember which thing it's consciousness anyway half stream of consciousness half diary so it follows an, an overall narrative thread but in in places with no warning it'll jut off to a random memory or a random thought or you know it it's it feels a little disjointed and I it was absolutely intentional. You can you can tell that this, this was written stylistically for that reason. And and it's it's I think it's done a, a great job executing that. For me personally, it is not my favorite writing style. It's a, it like I said to me it feels disjointed and it's sometimes hard to follow and because of that it's hard to sometimes keep an emotional investment going where it feels like it's building but then it fractures and then I, I, I almost feel like I, I kind of revert back a little bit in my investment. And and I think it's, like I said, I think it's, it's the style of writing and that I struggle a bit with it. However, the content of the book, the message of it, and the lens that it was written through, I thought is, is really, really interesting. And I... I'm glad that I am reading it. It is the perspective of a young 20-something American Chinese woman who is um, first generation Chinese, as in her parents were both from China and they emigrated uh, to the United States. She was born in the United States, moved back to China for a couple years in her childhood, but has spent most of her life in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and her career is in writing in tech journals and her experience as a young woman of Chinese descent in the very white male older dominated technology industry and specifically in Silicon Valley and it's fascinating to see things through her eyes, those little microaggressions that so many of us can look at and say, oh, that was, they didn't mean it like that. They, you know, they weren't actively trying to offend anybody. That's not, you know, an intentional thing. It's just a one-off incident. To somebody who doesn't suffer from microaggressions, yeah, to you, it was a one-off incident that has absolutely no impact. But when you're seeing it finally through the eyes of somebody who has to live like this all day every day it's not just one-off it's a compilation it's a series of building and building and building you know it's if if you come if somebody comes by and gives you a paper cut across your arm oh that's just a one-off incident but imagine you know 10 interactions a day somebody's giving you a paper cut on a different part of your body that's not just a one-off, that's not meaningless to you, it builds and it compiles and it compresses in on you. And so it talks about her, her struggling with her view of herself because of the, the lens that everybody else views her with in her industry, in her life. And it's, it's, a, it's an elegantly written book. Um, I think it's an incredibly important 
voice. It's an incredibly important story and it's written in a way that you are feeling it with the character, even if you, maybe like myself, don't have a point of reference, don't suffer from that num that amount of microaggressions. You know, as a woman, I obviously have dealt with gender issues, of equality issues, of sexism, misogynism, uh, misogyny, and. I can relate to the character on that level, but there is a whole other level that is outside of my scope of experience. And I think that's part of why reading is so important because you, you need to be able to understand the world as other people experience it, not just how you experience it. So in that way, I really do like this book and I really appreciate having the opportunity to read it and, and see some of that lived experience. I am just struggling a bit with the style, like I said, because I, the way that I take in information and become emotionally invested is through a continuous stream that has less fracturing. Um, but I, I'm definitely not DNFing it. I had, I have no desire to, no, no consideration for it. Um, I'm, I am enjoying it, and I am working my way through it to try to take and and grasp and keep as much of the experience that I can. I only have like six days left on my hold in Libby though, so I do need to pick it up. I'm not quite halfway through, and I am really hoping to finish this before my hold ends because that would be really weird to be like 70 to 80% of the way through a book and then lose access to it. I don't know how that would make me feel and it's stressing me out. So hopefully I'll have an update soon on finishing that and my impressions of it. Um, but so far, I would, I would recommend that if that's a topic um, and feel that interests you, you know, check that out. And I, that's all I have for right now. I got to get back to work, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I will see you soon and I will give you guys an update on my next book choice as well, um, because I need something to replace The Buried Giant now that I finished that. So I will talk to you soon, and like I said, I hope you are doing well. I hope you're doing better than I am, and if you're not, I hope things get better soon. All right, I will see you later. to try some non-dairy fudge, salted fudge bar ice cream. Uh, it has oat milk for the base, so I was curious to see what it tastes like. It's an interesting texture. It's not as smooth and creamy as ice cream, 
but it's not bad. It's not like cake batter. It's not as wet and smooth feeling when you're mixing it. Brownie batter is way grainier. It's like that, but not in an unpleasant way. No, it's cold brownie batter. I like it. I'd, I like it. I would get this again. I also probably wouldn't even think about it. Like, if you just gave this to me and said it was ice cream, I would never in a million years guess it's not dairy. I would just think they are intentionally going for a brownie batter texture. What I really wanted was their non-dairy ube swirl. Oh my gosh. It's like a coconut milk base with... Um, actual shredded coconut in it and then ube spread swirled throughout and it is oh my gosh like the best ice cream I've ever had and they did not have it and I was very sad and I did not think I would like the coconut milk ice cream but it was so good but yeah it was pretty good I would definitely get this again non-dairy salted fudge bar ice cream from Baskin Robbins. It's a thumbs up for me.